Hello and welcome to the Road Centre podcast. My name is Mark Blythe. I'm the director of the Roads Centre at the Watson Institute at Brown University. So, those of you who are listening to this podcast and possibly watching it on YouTube realise that, like everyone else, I'm under lockdown. And so is my guest for today, but we'll get to her in a moment. We usually bring people to Brown so that they can tell us stuff we don't know, and then we record the podcast. Unfortunately, now we can't really do that in terms of bringing them to Brown, but we can still do the podcast. In fact, we're going to up the number of podcasts. So today, before we introduce our guest, Jasmine Sierra, I just want to give you a heads up on some people that we've got coming in over the next few weeks into the summer. Uh, Stephanie Kelton, who was Bernie's economic advisor, has a book coming out called The Deficit Myth. We're going to be talking about that. Martin Sanbu, who's possibly the smartest person at the Financial Times, I'm going to say that because he's a friend of mine, uh, has a book coming out called The Economics of Belonging. We're going to be talking about that. Alex Cooley and Dan Nexon, two very cool political scientists, have a book coming out on how hegemony fails. In other words, why the decline of the United States is baked into the cake and predates anything Trump may or may not be doing. So lots of interesting stuff coming up. But now I will turn to the matter at hand, or the person at hand. I'd like to welcome to the Rhodes podcast, Jasmine Sierra. Jasmine Sierra is no stranger to Brown. She was, in fact, a PhD at Brown. And I guess we should probably admit she was one of my PhD students. So there you go. She has taught me everything I ever knew about Latin America. She wrote a fabulous dissertation on the multinationalization of Brazilian business. And like I say, is the go-to person on all things Latin America. Now, we were going to have this talk at Watson about growth models. And we're going to talk about growth models in the course of our conversation. But given that the entire world is talking about COVID, and it's usually talking about the European experience, or it's talking about the American experience, let's bring in someone to talk about Latin America and what Latin America is doing and how we should think about Latin America's experiencing of this crisis. So with that, Jasmine, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the podcast. It's great to have you here on the podcast, although you're not here, obviously. You're there and I'm here. But with anyway, we're used to using those words, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. So let's get started on this one then. So everybody's talking COVID. We're no different. But how is the COVID crisis here seen in Latin America? How, what do they think when they look at what we're doing and what we're not doing? And how do they think about this virus and react to it? I think overall, the uh, reaction in Latin America is of absolute shock to what they're seeing in Europe and the United States. So they're used to um, seeing the United States and Europe as models um, in terms of public policy, in particular in terms of health policy. And just to see how some of these countries have botched the crisis, I think it's just total shock and realizing that um, Europe and the U.S. cannot be a model for this crisis, that they need to start looking elsewhere. Um, that, of course, varies by country, and there are a few exceptions. And I think the two notable ones that we'll talk about in more detail are uh, Brazil and Mexico, where both presidents have really followed the Trump playbook. Um, and in particular, Bolsonaro in Brazil has done that because he really admires Trump. Um, and he has decided to kind of base the Brazil strategy on coronavirus on Trump. So it does seem like those countries are the exception there. But I think the rest of Latin America is really in shock at how bad it is in the U.S. and Europe. But when we think about the U.S. and Europe, we tend to think, OK, so Spain's been really, really badly hit and Italy's been badly hit, but they're coping and then we have this interesting experience in Sweden. The German numbers are ridiculously low for reasons we can't fathom. Uh, Central Europe's hardly been touched. The Baltics hardly have any cases. It really does seem to be these sort of Southern European countries in the United States, which are the deeply problematic ones. So you said that before we get into the country cases, try and set some context here before we begin to talk about it. Why is Latin America different from, let's say, the way that we talk about, oh, Spain's doing this, and America is doing this. What's, what do we need to know to get it right? So I think there are a couple of things that are particular about the Latin American situation. First, it's the most unequal region in the world, right? And high levels of inequality really impact how you can deal with the crisis. Um, so the kinds of regulations like social distancing, recommendations like frequent hand washing, stockpiling food are just much more difficult to implement. Um, in a very unequal region. Um, so if we think about a fifth of Latin America's uh, population lives in slums, right? So very close quarters. So the types of public policy dilemmas that you have there are very different. 
The other big issue in Latin America is high degrees of informality. So the informal sector is representing 40% of regional GDP and almost 50% of employment. Um, and this is a huge problem, right? Because you can't tell someone that works on the street to work from home. Um, they don't have a tax ID number. They don't have a connection to organized labor. So how do you get them the kind of economic support that they're going to need if you want them to stay at home? How do you guarantee their income? And I think the third big thing that we need to watch out for in Latin America is that things were not going well even before the coronavirus crisis. Um, so the region was really lagging in terms of growth. Um, high levels of dependency to external capital and external trade markets meant that the China trade war with the U.S. had really hit the region badly. And so you really had stagnant growth and growing poverty all across the region in the last five years. And so it almost seems like the coronavirus crisis is hitting at the worst possible time. So we tend to think about the effect on the rich parts of the world. We tend to think about the effects on China. There's some attention to Africa because it may be the worst hit place. But what you're suggesting is kind of right under our noses is this entire continent that may be in a way uniquely vulnerable to this moment. Yes. I mean, several of these characteristics of Latin America, to be fair, are characteristics of developing countries in general, right? Um, but you really kind of see this super uh, negative cocktail in Latin America, where the only thing that really the region might have going for itself, if we kind of want to end on a high note, is a younger population. Um, and segmented welfare states that work for insiders. They work for the formal sector more or less well, at least in Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. What do you mean by segmented welfare states? Tell, tell us what you mean by that. So basically, um, starting in the 1950s, Latin American countries built pretty robust welfare states um, in terms of public health and public education. Um, but these welfare states really weren't very good at dealing with market reforms that really changed the underlying economies. So because of market reforms, you had a huge growth in informal unemployment, huge spikes in poverty and people that are just not part of the formal welfare system. Now, the left governments that we saw in, you know, a decade, a decade and a half ago tried to deal with this problem and slightly expand these welfare states to the informal sector. But the degree to which they did it really varies. Um, and now we're seeing what the potential consequences of that are going to be where we don't have a huge sector of the population being able to access health during this crisis. Well, in fairness, we also see that in the United States. I mean, we managed to segment by basically either having people who had no coverage or running it through their employers, which means now they're unemployed, they also have no coverage. So there may be more of a similarity there than we think. But let's go with the differences with the most similar case. Start with Brazil. Tell us about Bolsonaro. Tell us about what they're doing. I just went on the BBC website before we were chatting, and they have drone footage of the largest cemetery in Latin America, which is in Sao Paulo. And this drone's just flying over hundreds and hundreds of freshly dug graves. So it does seem to be the case that they are having a problem. So why does Bolsonaro not think he's having a problem? Yes. Well, you're absolutely right, right? As we are recording this, there are 30,000 official cases in Brazil and 2,000 deaths. But the kind of data that you're telling us about shows us that the probably this is grossly underestimating the situation. So, you know, Bolsonaro is really an outlier in the region now in how hard his anti-coronavirus stance has been. Um, and initially, as I was mentioning at the beginning, he really felt emboldened by Trump's lack of action. So he definitely saw himself as kind of the Latin American um, Trump. And he had a lot of similarities with Trump, right? He's a political outsider. Um, he comes with a coalition that's tied to right wing conservative evangelicals, which are very much anti-science. They don't believe in climate change. They don't believe in vaccines. Um, and we saw some of that kind of stance translate over to the coronavirus, where he's very skeptical of what um, sci scientists are telling him, what kind of the more technocratic wings of the government are telling him to do. And so there has been this constant fight in Brazilian politics, sometimes even leading up to the Supreme Court, over what measures to take regarding coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So basically, the subnational governments have taken 
very similar to the United States, pretty strong stances against coronavirus, trying to implement quarantines. Bolsonaro has repeatedly tried to undermine that using kind of the power of the presidency to do this. Um, and he has this even very familiar. I have it's to extremely say. familiar. Like you watch Brazilian politics and you're watching American politics. So wow. basically the Brazilian population is being saved by a few kind of moderate governors um, that are just uh, listening to kind of what is the scientific uh, advice regarding what to do. So let's do the comparison directly then. So we have this governor called Cuomo. We have the worst hit city, New York. And we have a standoff with the president who doesn't like what he's doing, et cetera, et cetera. Sounds very similar. Except New York is New York, right? It's the home to $4 trillion in real estate. It's the home of Wall Street. Even the hollowed out, battered sort of carcass of the American state still has some capacity in that New York City is basically the GDP of a small European country. So they can do stuff. Can the local governors in Brazil protect their population in the way that Andrew Cuomo can do it? I mean, if you're the governor of Sao Paulo, and I think that would be the best comparison with the state of New York and the city of New York, yes, you can. Um, you can in terms of your political power and in terms of your economic power. Now, something I will say that's interesting about kind of the segmented reaction that we're seeing in Brazil is that even though Bolsonaro has completely botched um, the health response to this, there is an economic response to the crisis that has been slowly being designed in Brazil. And that I think is particularly notable given the context um, in which this is happening, which is that Brazil through Bolsonaro had basically committed to hardcore austerity. And that hardcore austerity had really brought um, pretty bad economic um, consequences in the first years of the Bolsonaro presidency. So in 2018, GDP was, I think, 5% lower than when uh, Bolsonaro came to power. Unemployment had increased by 5%. Um, you now have 40% of informal workers, 20% of Brazilians under the poverty line. So things weren't going great, but really Brazil had committed to austerity by creating a kind of a constitutional amendment, which basically generated an expenditure ceiling. So the amendment mandated zero growth in federal spending after it had been enacted. So basically, after 2016, your uh, spending could not increase beyond the 2016 levels. So and as the economy grew, then that's a real term reduction in spending every single year. So you're baking austerity into the cake. Absolutely. Over time, austerity would only increase and be multiplied under these rules. Now, suddenly the coronavirus comes, right? And you need to have the kind of economic intervention that that constitutional clause doesn't allow you to do. So what happened? They now had to do a constitutional amendment and basically create a separate war budget um, that is allowing the country to kind of have the type of economic rescue package that it's necessary. And that went through the Senate a couple of days ago. So this is fascinating because now the comparator is Germany. Yes. Right, because the Germans had the Schwarze Null, right? The black zero on the budget. We will balance the budget no matter what. <laughs> And they realized, even they realized, oh, this is a bit stupid in the middle of a pandemic. So they kind of said, well, we'll just pretend it's not there for a while and we'll do this kind of off budget expenditure, but we'll get back to balancing the books as soon as possible. So it sounds like they've got a little bit of that going on as well. It's not just the American model. It's like they're trying to shove the German solution into the American problem in a way. Absolutely. You know, it's really interesting to compare. Now, I have a little bit more faith that Germany might go back to its discipline budget um, than Brazil, because Brazil's not a country that has really had a consensus on austerity, mm -hmm. right? If you look at how Brazil even did market reforms, they did it through a lot of state involvement um, and a lot of state spending. And I think that actually made Brazil fare a lot better uh, from market reforms than, for example, my home country of Argentina. So Bolsonaro and his crowd, they were really outliers mm -hmm. um, in terms of Brazilian politics and kind of this push towards reducing the state. And I, I think one of the consequences for Brazil is going to be the end of the short-lived austerity experiment. Yeah, interesting. So there's a, a Bond newsletter that I get that comes into my uh, email on Monday mornings. That's about Latin America. And uh, whenever they talk about Brazil, they're like, international investors love Bolsonaro and yields are down and flows are up and everything's going great. But you're looking at this at a rather different perspective, which is actually they can't do without that state budget, right? I mean, there, 
you know, if you just look at the numbers of the economy, the economy wasn't doing well. And definitely kind of tying your hands that way provides you no wiggle room when an international crisis comes. And if you have a growth model um, that is very dependent on the international economy, you better have those buffers in place to be able to compensate for what happens in the global economy, which is an external shock. You didn't create it, but you need to have a political response to it. Great stuff. Let's now move to the next door neighbor, which is everybody's favorite serial defaulter and your home country, Argentina. So what's going on there? So Argentina, you know, it's really it's funny because this is really the worst time that the coronavirus crisis could have hit Argentina. Right. The economy was in ruins before the coronavirus crisis. And so we have a new president, Alberto Fernandez, from the Peronist Party. And really, he really came to power in an economy that had been crippled by the kind of market friendly center right government of Mauricio Macri that international investors loved until they didn't. Right. And so the Argentine peso had lost 68 percent of its value. Annual inflation was over 50 percent, you know, 2.5 fall percent of GDP all in 2008. Right. And the economy had contracted an additional 2 percent. Can, can, can we get into something for a minute before yeah. we go to uh, the, the corona? What happened in Argentina? Because let's get into this for a minute. Right. Macri comes in. He has this plan, sta stabilization plan. The stabilization plan is applauded by everyone from the IMF to the Christmas gnomes. Right. Everyone says it's gradualism, all right? This is the way to do it, boom, boom, boom. So they do everything that everybody says is right. And then basically two years in, financial markets went mental. What happened? So, I mean, first of all, I would say everyone is saying that this is the right plan is the IMF and international investors, right? Yes. In Argentina, there was a lot of concern about the social consequences of this plan, right? Uh, because you already had an external scenario that was very bad for Argentina in the sense that commodity prices were down, Chinese financing was down, we had growing levels of uh, fiscal deficit and of external debt, right? So in that context, to try to contract the economy even further with the types of measures that Macri was trying to implement was um, probably a, a bad decision. And so what Macri does is that he takes a huge loan from the IMF, the largest loan in IMF's history to a single country. And what's particular about the IMF loan is that it's not given in a way that it's uh, broken up into several pieces. Right. They give the bulk of it, two thirds of it directly to the Macri government. And what does the Macri government do? It uses that money not to do a massive infrastructure plan, not to do social policy. It uses the bulk of that money to try to deal with uh, capital outflows. So it really refuses to put capital controls, thinking that it can handle the situation with the IMF rescue package. But capital continues to leave Argentina. So eventually Macri establishes partial capital controls. Investors lose confidence. And then you get the cycle and then it just starts to go. And you get the cycle without having used any of that money to generate any kind of productive change in the economy. Wow. So you, you take on a ton of debt and then basically you got all of the downside of the extra debt and none of the upside of the loan at all. Exactly. And then, and then Corona hits. So how are they dealing with Corona? So um, the Fernandez government is basically the anti-Bolsonaro or even the anti-Trump in the sense that health-wise, he has done everything right, right? He took a very strong early stance on uh, the virus. He did an early and strict quarantine starting on the 20th of March in Argentina, where basically none of my family members can leave their house except to go to the supermarket or to a pharmacy. Um, and they closed down um, the, the all international flights into the country. So to a point that you even have Argentines that can't enter the country that were tourists abroad. And this is a huge political issue for the government. And this has been very successful. So uh, cases in Argentina are only doubling every four days compared to the U.S. every two days, right? And so Argentina is now in a situation where it can move over to a phase of trying to slowly open up the economy because the pandemic is more or less under control. The question is, how do you deal with the economic fallout of the pandemic when you're in the midst of a huge economic crisis and trying to renegotiate your debt? Again, with the oh IMF and with the Vulture. So, so you do all the right things and you walk out and the world's even worse. The world is even worse and Argentina is worse, right? Oh. So the economy is set to contract uh, by almost 6% in 2020, right? And the IMF is only guaranteeing a loan for 300 million in 2020, 2021 to Argentina. So, so, so are, the Argent 
Are the IMF at the point that they're given so much that they can't allow it to fail? Has Argentina become too big to fail? Argentina has become too big to fail for the IMF. Absolutely. And part of the story is that we now have a new head of the IMF coming in, right? Mm -hmm. The loan to Mauricio Macri, basically kind of the person that owns it politically was a prior IMF director. And so the new administration is looking at this and saying, we can't have the IMF seen as responsible for another Argentine crisis, but we also didn't create that. So that leaves a little bit of a wiggle room for the IMF to kind of be coy about how much is going to help Argentina and how much it agrees with the Argentine proposal um, to the loan uh, debt holders. Okay, so let's go north. Viva Mexico. What's going on there? So Mexico is a really interesting case, right? Because here we have a left-wing populist, not a right-wing populist. You have the left-wing Trump virus denial, right? Exactly. So what does uh, being a left-wing populist denier look like? We can see Mexico for that, right? So um, it's interesting because AMLO, whereas the Mexican president is known by his initials, um, he was still campaigning in the midst of the rise of the coronavirus crisis in Mexico. He was hugging um, and kissing his supporters over the country. But he eventually came around, right? And now he's staying in Mexico City. He is more or less agreeing to the quarantine measures that um, his health minister and others within the government have really pushed for. So in that sense, he's a little bit more of a Boris Johnson than a Bolsonaro. So faced with the facts, he has eventually decided um, that the country needs to go through the quarantine. But we know we're in Mexico at 6,000 cases 486 deaths, and we're not even at the beginning or near the peak. And um, there's significant under-testing in the country. Is there any way of judging between the... Let's take Argentina out. Let's assume they've done the right thing, right? Between Brazil and Mexico, where do you think the crisis, the corona crisis, just in terms of death and destruction, is going to actually reap the most? Which one's going to be worse off, given their actions? They're hard to compare, right? Because there are different dimensions. So one dimension is the health system. Um, And it's stronger in Brazil than in Mexico. Um, Another dimension is the degree to which uh, social policies reach the informal sector. And traditionally, that has been, again, stronger in Brazil than in Mexico. The actual measures that the new government is taking are better in Mexico than in Brazil. But you kind of need to combine what governments are doing now with the underlying structural um, factors, right? And in that sense... You know, Brazil has a lot going from it, precisely from the pre-austerity years. Mm -hmm. This left a whole architecture of social policy that this government can build on, that Mexico didn't have. If it chooses to. If it chooses to. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, the current government is expanding in Brazil social policy. So it's expanding the Workers' Party signature social policy, Bolsa Familia, so that it will now reach one million families. So they're doing... That's like Trump expanding Obamacare. That's amazing. That is amazing. So you're seeing, you know, some, especially among Brazilian Congress, you know, they're using the Brazilian developmentalist architecture Mm -hmm. to bail out business and to conduct social policy. And that's the kind of architecture that Mexico doesn't have. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit more in the economy here. Let's talk about the underlying growth models of these countries and then Latin America as a whole. We're involved in a project together on this called the New Politics of Growth and Stagnation, and our Latin America person is Jasmine. So let's start with Mexico. When I think of the Mexican growth model, not that we've done the GDP decomposition analysis, NAFTA seems pretty important. The United States seems pretty important. When I'm thinking about Brazil, I'm thinking about big commodity exports, as well as being a reasonably diversified economy that makes real stuff, but it's still commodity dependent. Argentina, I'm going to leave that one to you. Walk us through the growth models and then say how this big global shock basically filters through their particular growth models. I mean, one thing I will say about, for example, Brazil, Argentina, is that we tend to think of them as commodity driven growth models, right? And part of that is true, but mainly it's true not because of the huge percentage that agriculture has in the economies, but because they're the key source of dollars in Mm. these economies. So agriculture has a particular role to play in these economies, but most of the economy is actually driven uh, by services, right? right? And so what you get in both of these countries is um, the coronavirus is affecting both your capacity to export 
um, particularly to export commodities, and it's also affecting your internal consumption. And any kind of government intervention can help with your internal consumption, but it can't get you an export market, right? And here right. I'm kind of borrowing your, your line of thinking of this, because you always remind us that we don't need to think in terms of the units, right? That we need to think in terms of the system. And so one thing that's very particular about this crisis, and it's going to affect Latin America, many other developing countries, is that you can't export your way out of this crisis. Right. You can't play the trick that basically East Asia did after the East Asian financial crisis. You can't play the trick that the Europeans did after the financial crisis because there's nobody on the buy side. Exactly. Everybody's essentially on the stay at home sell side. And exactly. also one of the things I was reading today was a very interesting question is what happens to people's savings patterns after this crisis? Because if you get into a situation where buy, it isn't like you know one round and we're all done and we all go back to normal. If there's multiple rounds, you can bet that precautionary savings are going to go up. And if you're not, if you are saving, then you're not spending. So that collapse in demand begins to compound itself. So it could be even harder. Even the domestic side that you're talking about could have its own kind of self-fulfilling down spiral as well. And that's definitely something to worry about. But to go back to these cases, then, given what you say. Is it Mexico in better shape to basically weather the storm or is it Brazil again? How would you, or Argentina even, how would you adjudicate that? So it's really difficult to adjudicate between the three because um, they all have their strong vulnerabilities. So the strongest vulnerability of Mexico, which is the case that we haven't talked about yet, is how closely its economy is tied to the United States. So 78% of Mexican exports go to the United States. It imports 51% of products from the U.S. So experts believe that um, effects on the U.S. economy have a one-to-one -one consequence on Mexico. Wow. So unless the United States recovers and is able to kind of open up again its border uh, to Mexico in terms of migration flows and also recovers trade, Mexico won't recover. Um, and oh. the other impact that has the United States has on Mexico is through remittances, right? Mm. Uh, because as a, when there's high unemployment um, in the United States, that's going to affect the kind of workers that send remittances back to um, their home country, right? And so this is a huge problem for Mexico. It's completely dependent on the United States economy. One sort of little sliver of light in this, which has been a, a, a source of amusement, if not bemusement. Uh, I don't know if you caught the story about agricultural workers in California that were undocumented, essentially being given bits of paper to say to ICE that we're essential workers. And they right. are, right? And they are. No, they absolutely are. Absolutely. So you, again, it's, it's this funny moment whereby it's like we're trying to throw all these people out and you suddenly end up describing them as essential workers. The same thing happened in Britain with Romanian fruit pickers. A couple of plane loads had to come over, otherwise the crops are going to rot in the field. This whole crisis basically twists the way our, we should be thinking about who is essential and who is not essential to the economy. Absolutely. I mean, if there's one thing that this crisis shows is that we can't keep going with a system that has these levels of inequality and doesn't take care of the workers that basically make our economies run. Right? Um, right. And in the case of the United States, it's very tied to kind of having finally some kind of legislation on Mexican migration. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Whether they're actually up to the challenge once this is over, we'll see. Um, let me push you in a different direction as we begin to slowly run out of time. We're not quite there yet. So let me be provocative. If I think about Latin America as a whole, which I probably shouldn't, but I will, I see a place that's heavily dependent on FDI. And that basically the Brazilian bourgeoisie and the Argentine bourgeoisie, would, to use that term, would rather buy a, a Park Avenue apartment and park the money there than invest in their own country and risk sequestration from their own political parties. Um, that capital flight is an ever-present possibility because of that. So you have very fragile and volatile economies. And even though you're correct to say that, yet yeah, commodities aren't at the biggest part of the economy, they are, as you say, vital because that's how you get dollars. And without dollars, you can't import, right? So they're, they're kind of stuck in this bind. Now, I was rereading Eric Haliner's book, uh, The Forgotten Foundations of Bretton Woods. And one of the arguments that he makes is that there wasn't the, the the North came together in 1944 to Britain Woods and came up with all these amazing plans. A lot of these amazing plans to do with things like import substitution, industrialization, industrialization of southern countries so that they can basically grow with rather than opposition to the dominant European powers actually came from places like Brazil. 
They came from places like Argentina. And there was an attempt in the 30s and 40s and 50s to really change the growth model of these countries. Ultimately, it kind of crashed and burned to a certain extent in the 1970s and 80s, hence market reforms, etc. Do you think this moment might be another opportunity for a reset of these countries' growth models? Or is that just too baked into the cake? So it's really... I think the external scenario is very different from what we saw in the 1940s and 1950s in the sense that this was a scenario where you had a complete consensus on developmentalist ideas, but you also had room to maneuver. So the United States was not only willing to finance some of these developmentalist projects itself, but was willing to kind of let countries run with them. You now have, as you very well know, a host of international rules and institutions that don't allow governments to undertake the kinds of industrial policies that made the East Asian tigers grow, right? Well, hang on. But with Trump basically saying to hell with the WTO, with the appellate court running out of judges, I mean, the whole thing's becoming a bit of a sham. The Brits have decided industrial policies are back in fashion. The Europeans have realized that China will buy up all their tech unless they start being protectionist. Maybe the environment is moving a bit in that direction, no? Well, I don't know. I think, you know, there are there's picking and choosing about which WTO rules want to the United States wants to respect and which ones it wants to shun. So I'm a bit skeptical the degree to which that will actually allow for a greater policy space. Now, that doesn't mean that countries in the global south can't find creative ways of finding new forms of supporting their domestic industries. But I still think there are significant uh, constraints um, so we're seeing now, for example, patents on medications, right? To what, and this is a huge issue for the types of medicines that are going to be developed for coronavirus, right? Who's going to have these patents? How strongly are they going to be protected? Who's going to be willing to break them? So you're absolutely right. This is a key moment in terms of those kinds of regulations, but I'm not sure to what degree they're going to be relaxed on developing countries. Mm. So I don't see kind of the same possibilities that we saw in the 1940s and 1950s in the sense that this isn't a period where we're going to see, I think, high levels of economic growth in the same way that we saw after World War II. I think there's still a much more restrictive environment. Um, and I don't see the kinds of huge capital um, inflows that came after World War II to developing countries that allowed for these industrialization projects to happen. So more of the same with the same old broken models, essentially. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's going to be a very difficult period for the next uh, few years for Latin America. And I think they're going to kind of stumble their way out of the crisis. What I do think is going to happen is that we are going to see, particularly in Brazil, um, that the kind of project that Bolsonaro represents, it's not going to be, it's going to be delegitimized. De and that's going to have an effect in the region. So I think the Fernandez types of Argentina that are much more center left, moderate, more technocratic, mm -hmm there's going to be a much more uh, favorable view of those types of political projects. Mm -hmm. So one question in closing then, seeing as we're running out of time. If I stop talking, we will run out of less time, but you know what I'm saying. Anyway, the BRICS, remember those? Yes. Remember the Brazil, Russia, India, China, they were going to change the world, right? It was all a load of crap from Goldman Sachs, wasn't it? Or was it actually possible at some point? It just got derailed? I mean, what do you think? Well, you know, they have some bite, right? They have the new development bank um, that is now providing vast amounts of lending in the middle of the crisis. So I think mm -hmm. what's interesting about Goldman Sachs is that it was a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? They created the acronym and these countries began believing in it and they created mm -hmm. some institutions um, that put a little bit of financial power behind that idea. But the key there is what's China going to do? Is China going to continue kind of its global state capital some project um, and continue creating these alternative institutions to the traditional multilateral banks and channeling finance for that and just being a leader of these countries? Or is the coronavirus going to generate a period for China that's very much inward looking? And yeah. I think that's the big question for what's going to happen for the BRICS, because you're right, the BRICS was a fantasy. But what was behind that was a Chinese foreign economic policy project that used right. India and Brazil at different points to kind of create these institutions and to create the sense of greater multilateralness. So I think that's the open question. And I'll leave and that so for that, the yeah. next expert that you invite on China to the podcast. Well, we had one on a couple of episodes ago, so we can't go that way, unfortunately. But it is a nice note to finish on that basically, rather than the bricks, maybe we have the cribs 
<laughs> which is basically China bankrolling Brazil and India and Russia. So maybe that's where we'll be heading to in the future. In the meantime, thanks for coming on and telling us so much about Latin America. That was really great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure to talk to you. This episode of the Road Centre podcast was produced by Dan Richards. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favourite podcast app. If you like us, rate us on iTunes and help others find the podcast as well. For more information, go to watson.brown.edu slash roads. Thanks for listening. Thank you.